Hi, I'm Todd Nock, and welcome to my YouTube channel. So I'm starting a new two-part series here, and I'm drawing Wonder Woman. So Wonder Woman is a really, really challenging character to draw, and I'll be explaining more as we do the line art here in this first video. Second video will be the Copic marker color. But Wonder Woman can be a really challenging character because of her facial structure. You want it, you know, you want those strong Amazonian features, but you want that femininity. So she can be a real challenge to draw, and it takes a lot of practice. Here with the line art though, we'll be doing this uh, pencil work, which will be pretty sketchy, loose pencils, then with uh, tighter inked lines. But the trick I'm gonna do here with the inks is I'm gonna ink with colored micron and multi-liner pens for a different kind of uh, color hold effect. And I'll explain more as we draw. So let's flip the camera around, let's get to drawing. Okay, so I have a piece of nine by 12 smooth Strathmore Bristol board, and I'm using my Pentel Twist Erase 0.5 HP lead mechanical pencil to start off here with the pencil stage. So I'm just going to rough in the body shapes, just uh, kind of lightly drawing things in, starting with the head, moving here to the upper torso. Just got to break down the shapes and put in the guidelines uh, as I start to construct uh, the figure here. So I pretty much had the pose in my mind, uh, an, a, a vague idea of what I wanted my Wonder Woman pose to be. Kind of battle stance, battle ready, uh, kind of hunkered down, getting ready to fight. So um, oftentimes I'll have a, an idea of a pose in my head, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that's what's going to show up on the paper. Sometimes I, as I start to sketch, I will make edits. I will try new things. It's like maybe I'll try moving the leg from one position to another once I start putting things down on paper. I try to stay flexible enough in my expectations that I can make changes as I go to see what might work better uh, in utilizing the space. So I don't, don't hold too tightly to the idea or image in my head, but it's mostly just a guideline, a, a an idea that is fully free to go in different directions once I start putting pencil to paper, once I start sketching things out. I, I want to have that freedom to make, make changes and different decisions as I go. So it's just a matter of just playing with the shapes. A lot of these shapes you know, come from uh, the life drawing classes I had in art school, as well as just continued study beyond art school, continually studying different poses, different uh, aspects of muscles, of of physical structure of the human form, because every every angle, every movement is going to change the shape of, of the muscle, of the body part. So I, I want to keep these things in mind. Some of the, a, a lot of this is based on, you know, study of real life. And then a good chunk of this is based on just imagination and try to find the line to walk between the two. Because that's one fun thing about comics is that it's an exaggeration of the figure. But I want to base my exaggeration on reality so that my exaggeration is is just w one step removed from reality as much as possible. It's the Todd Knock flavor filter coming through here, uh, taking real life and putting it through the Todd Knock filter. So study real life as much as possible, gang. You're, it's really going to help your art level up uh, in, in, in really great ways. And it, and it helps you... Uh, get some of that accuracy that you might feel you want or need in your in your figures no matter how how exaggerated your style might be how stylized your style might be basing it off real life would, would be uh, an ideal choice like i remember seeing a behind the scenes video for the disney movie the lion king all the animals they based off of real life as they found their stylized version of those animals, you know, Simba and Mufasa and Rafiki and everyone. So, so pace off real life whenever you can. Okay, and, and a lot of this initial sketching stage is just really, really noodling in the, 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 the details and shapes, the, well, the shapes as much as possible first. I'm gonna come in and, and tighten up some of the details of Wonder Woman's costume once I feel I've gotten all the body part shapes where I want them or need them to be. As I uh, take a look at what I'm doing, take a step back, come back, start adding some more lines, take another step back. Really just going through the process of, of putting things together, of, of keeping in mind what it is I'm drawing and what it is that's coming down on the paper. This is why the sketch stage can be so beneficial is because it gives us a chance to kind of see 
what direction we're heading. Do we want to make any changes before we're too pot committed to the illustration where there is no turning back? And the freedom to make changes wherever necessary, like right here. Just did not like where this arm was. I didn't like the way it utilized the space. I didn't like the way it fit for Wonder Woman. So I decided to change it up here. And we're going to use a little more foreshortening. I thought it would be a more interesting look to have it a little more foreshortened. The forearm comes down, or the upper arm comes down, and the forearm coming back up towards the reader. Fist higher in the air here as she will be holding her magic lasso, which is uh, one of the, her props, one of her elements of her... Well, I guess props is the best word for it. One of the props is, that's very well-known, the, the, the most one of the most her most classic props is her magic lasso, and with it I can draw this rope. Uh, you know, one hand has the, the 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 bulk of the rope, and then the other hand has the lasso part, and then I can then draw the, a rope design that connects the two from one side to the next, like right there, just cutting it through, just kind of letting the life and bounce cut from one side to the other, and also keeping in mind design elements. What are the, what are the shapes that the lasso or the, uh, the, the bundle of rope in the other hand make? So design is a really big element in when we're putting together pieces like this. Really keep in mind the design and the shapes that are being made and where you're leading the re viewer's eye from one bit to the next. Uh, we can go in all sorts of different shapes. Oh, we're going to throw some rocks down here for, to give Wonder Woman a, a, an environment to stand on. So, uh, so don't discount the de element of design and, and how the eye flow of the viewer would or could come into play. Adding a little more detail to the boots. Not adding too much detail to the rocks right now. Still a little too early for that. I kind of just let myself bounce from one element of the figure to the next. Do a little bit on the face, then just, I kind of just let my, my brain go where it needs to go. Uh, I'll, I'll be working on one part and then immediately just jump over to the next part. There's no real rhyme or reason. It's just just kind of letting the creativity move me as it does. You know, if st start working a little bit on the face, then I just get really focused on the hand all of a sudden. Because every element is going to get the attention it needs in, in, in its time. In fact, we're going to zoom in here so you can, so we can get a better look as I illustrate Wonder Woman's face, start to tighten up the details. Now, as I said at the top of this video, Wonder Woman can be a very challenging character to draw, and, and here's why. And mind you, this is just my personal take on Wonder Woman. Your results may vary, but for me, Wonder Woman, I want to convey the strength and power of her Amazonian heritage, of her warrior training, and, and, and the, the, the warrior world of, of, of Amazon women that she comes from is conveying that strength. So I want her to have strong facial features, a strong jaw, a strong nose. Uh, but I don't want it to be almost like it's chiseled from rock, you know, where it's cutting, jutting edges. I'm not looking for that. Uh, but I also want to convey the goddess-like beauty of, of uh, Wonder Woman. And so it's walking this, this line between these two aspects that I find to be such the challenge. So those are the things I try to keep in mind. How can, and, and I reference from real life, uh, uh, maybe um, women who, who portray these features, whether it be actresses who have portrayed Wonder Woman or uh, just, just any other sort of model that might have that sort of, just that right angle of a jawline, just that right strength to the nose. There's the right sort of shape to the eyes, a very almond shape sort of eye is what I oftentimes go for. So these are the things I keep in mind when I'm drawing my Wonder Woman, especially when I'm drawing her face. Now, as you've, while you've watched me working here, you see that I've broken down her face in the different, uh, with the different guidelines needed. The, the, eye, the eye line, the nose line, the mouth line. These these are these are important guidelines. The eye eyes fall from the top of the uh, fall right in between the middle between the top of the head and the chin. The nose falls roughly between the eye line and the chin, and then the mouth falls roughly between the nose line and the chin. And so these are the the, the basic places to keep in mind where to structure where the eyes, nose, and mouth will be. 
And I believe I switched to the Uni Kurotoga 0.3 HB lead mechanical pencil here to um, have finer detail. The 0.3 lead allows me for finer detail than the 0.5 lead. Okay, so adding... So you see I got the tiara in there, and then the hair is going to fall from behind, starting from behind the tiara. So oftentimes when I'm drawing my hair, I consider the hairline and pulling from the root outwards. And uh, right now just some big broad strokes to get the, the just a generalized sense of the flow of the hair. This is just a really rough estimation of how the hair could go. So... Uh, with the hair here, I wanted it to be in motion because maybe with this battle stance, she's just kind of just twisted and turned to this battle stance. And so her hair is, in a sense, kind of following suit. So it's kind of flitting and flowing about. So I really wanted that motion of the hair, similarly to the design elements and motion of her magic lasso. I apologize that some of these bits are a little off screen. I forgot, I maybe have forgot that I'd uh, pushed in the, the camera uh, for a closer closer shot here, so uh, I do apologize for that. Hopefully, there's not too much of it off screen. Okay, so uh, just keeping in mind the shape of the head as well. That's why we draw the full oval for the head, so that when we're drawing our hair, there's a full head underneath, and we don't cut the hair too soon to where it creates a an odd shape that makes it look like there's not a skull uh, underneath. So you want to keep that in mind. So um, drew in the stars for her earrings. And now uh, just needed to adjust the jawline. Remember how I was saying the jawline could be a challenge? Just kind of erasing that a little bit and kind of cutting in here, jaw to the chin. Just really want to rework the shapes just a little bit. So I'm allowing myself to make some edits as I go. I love drawing eyebrows, the emotion that can be conveyed in the eyebrow. And the cheek lines often follow from where we had set that nose line. A lot of decisions of the final line will be made when I move into the inking stage a little later on in this video. And don't be afraid to erase. Don't be afraid to erase and, and try cutting those, those shapes where you need them to be as best as possible before you moved to the uh, inking stage. Just making sure things are lining up. So putting my guidelines back in. Sometimes I'll rough in some circles there for the cheeks just to make sure the cheeks kind of fit in the place where they'll want to be. Even though we will not see those circles for her cheeks or chin when we move to the inking stage, it is a guideline for me that helps me in the construction of the face when I move into the finished inks uh, so that I know uh, where, where, where I want my lines to be to convey the, the shapes of, of her face. And putting more detail into her uniform here, into the costume, the W. The W is uh, you know, similar to Superman's S. It has specific shapes uh, that, that follow a kind of a certain rule. So the, uh, the, the W's can help convey the uh, form and mass of her chest. So they kind of arc around with the, the center point of the W following in the middle. There's a, it's a three-tiered um, outer part to the W, uh, even though it's Two, two W's, there's a, a separation in, in the middle of the outer parts of those W's. So uh, keeping in mind some of the, maybe sort of the darker shades that would fall on the red of her costume, adding in sort of the, kind of the girdle-like belt. Adding a little more muscle tone, musculature, not too much. I like Wonder Woman to have a sense of mass and, and musculature, but I don't I don't go, I try not to go too heavy with the muscle definition or detail. That's, again, just my personal preference. So putting a little more definition into the leg. Really, um, at, at this stage here, I'm oftentimes just 
tightening up those basic shapes just a little bit more, just to make sure I've got the, the shapes the way I want them to be for when I move to the inking stage, just uh, kind of clarifying which of these scribbles will be the, some of the final stuff I'm going to head towards in my, in my inks. A little more work on this this arm over here and the fist that's holding on to the, uh, the the coils of her her rope and how each finger wraps around. And now a little more detail on on this leg here, keeping in mind the thigh muscles. Many of these lines will just be guidelines, similarly with the face, same with the muscles, they're just guidelines for me for when I move into the inking stage. Start putting in details of the boot, she has that, that uh, white trim and stripe that runs, trim that runs around the, the outer portion of the boot and then the, the, the stripe that runs down the center. That's a little more delineation of, of the rocks that she'd be standing on. Rocks can be a lot of fun to draw because they're such a, such a organic shape, kind of chaotic, just chunks. You just can scribble in, scratch in chunks of, of, of line and, and, and chunks of black shape to, to convey rocks. Getting a little tighter with some of the details here as I go. Just kind of bouncing about, just as I said before, just working on one element and then change over to another element. Uh, some ways it kind of almost keeps it fresh for me. Oh, now I want to flush out these uh, coils of rope here. Try not to make them each, I try to make each one a little bit different, even if it's just subtly different, to create... Um, different shapes, uh, something, different shapes for the eye to play with. Uh, the end of the rope, swinging about down here. And then the rope as it comes from the top of her hand over towards the other hand. Sometimes when I go from one, one part of the figure to another, kind of allows me to, allows my eye to take a break from the place where I was working uh, focus on something else, and then when I come back to that place, like the going from the jaw, then down to the hand, then back up to the jaw, kind of allows my, my eye to kind of refresh in, in a micro moment to uh, see, do I catch something different? Uh, do I see it maybe a mistake that I want to fix or a different approach that I might want to take to that, that, that element that I was working on? Um, so... That's another reason why I kind of bounce from one thing to another is a kind of a little system refresh at, as I go. Because sometimes that's when we're struggling with a really difficult portion of an illustration and we get really frustrated with it, which is very common. I think every artist experiences that. Sometimes it's good just to kind of step away for a moment and then come back with a fresh eye. And then oftentimes that's when we're able to see what the problem was or is and gives our 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 eye and brain a, a chance to maybe come up with a new solution. And kind of adding some of the darks here to her hair. Um, I want to have uh, some good chunks of black in her hair to convey that that dark ebony hair, uh, but also leaving a uh, when I come into the inks, I'll have some nice big chunks of of open area that I'll come in with the Copic color to to uh, color her hair. So, but right now I just want some just generalized chunks of of dark uh, shade to to keep in mind uh, where I'll I'll be having those those big black areas in in her hair. Okay, and here's a shot of the really rough sketchy pencils. 
This is as far as I'm going to take it with the pencil detail before I move into the finished inked lines. But I wanted y'all to get a good shot of the pencil stage before we move into the inks coming up here in just one second. And here we go. It's time to drop in the inks. Okay, so I'm using my Pigma Micron pens here, the 08, 05, 01, and 005 uh, throughout this piece. And right now I'm starting with a brown pen. I'm using this brown pen. I'm going to be using colored microns to create a different effect, and it'll really come into play when we move into the Copic color stage. But with these colored pens, can give me it just makes the illustration look a little different. Kind of gives it. Uh, there's a term we use in comics when we make the the line art a different color. Because when I when I ink my comics, I'm inking them all in black ink. But then the colorist will come in and say, like, I think we did this in the Iceman video of the group shot. Uh, if you saw my X-Men group shot uh, series in the Iceman video, we used blue to, to ink Iceman because it gives him more of an ice effect. It makes him look a little different than the other characters around him. Uh, it makes him look more, almost in a sense, ice-like, translucent. So uh, here with, uh, it's almost sort of like that. Not that I'm trying to make uh, Wonder Woman look otherworldly. I just think it's kind of a fun, illustrative sort of look to it. It's almost sort of an animation sort of look to it. You know how animation in, in, in certain cartoons, they can uh, use different colored lines for the uh, for the different characters or the different shapes, and, and then the colors complement that. It's kind of a little bit like that. It's uh, probably the closest way I can explain it. I just think it's just kind of a fun, cool look. So that's what we're doing here. So with these microns, I'm using the 05 brown right here. And with it, I can, the, I'm, I'm hitting a, the, a lot of the main contour shapes, the, the, the bulky, uh, bigger, chunkier lines to con convey the, the main shapes of like her fingers or the lasso here. And depending on how much pressure I give the pen, I can get a thick or thin line. Oftentimes I like a thicker line to create, cre to convey the basic shape and then a thinner line for any uh, accentuating details. So a thicker line for each finger, each knuckle, but then maybe a little thinner line for any of the, maybe the cross hatching or little detail lines. Keep those a little thinner so that uh, with that size and weight variation of the line gives the viewer's eye uh, plenty to play with. Uh, and different things to focus on. I don't want those little t tiny lines to be too thick or as thick as the main uh, contour line of the shape, like the shape of the finger or the forearm or the elbow. If all the lines are the same shape, it can get kind of muddy and kind of stagnant. So th this is one of many reasons why I like to vary my line shape and weight. All right, so with the ropes here, it's a, it's a bit of a slow process, but just trying to maintain that same width from one section to the next, keeping the, the width of the rope, the rope as consistent as possible. Really allow yourself to take the time when you're uh, layering in your, your details like this. And since the rope goes over, Wonder Woman. I want to ink it first because it is in the foreground. I like to work foreground to background, ideally. I'll be using other colors of pens to ink other parts of Wonder Woman as I go. So um, I will want the. I will keep in mind which colors need to overlap over which other whichever other colors. So the things in the foreground are going to be what is inked in that dominant color. This is where it kind of gets fun, but also challenging is when the, the rope starts to uh, bend and curve and twist and turn all amongst itself. Um, and so trying to keep those different layers in the right place. So considering the start and stop of each of each um, section of rope is something to keep in mind. It's kind of a puzzle. 
keeping that puzzle in mind and knowing the direction I'm heading, where I want to, want to go, need to be, so that things line up as best as possible. Not getting too crazy with the line weights here. Um, they're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward with the uh, with the rope there. Adding a little more line weights, or I'm utilizing more line weights as I ink. Like the palm of the hand is a little further away, so it gets a little bit thicker of a line to convey the sense of a shadow. Um, it's a very subtle. The line weights can be very subtle uh, communication of, of light and shadow. And apparently I got distracted by something because we have some... Oh, here we go. I'm back. I'm back to inking. Oh, I was changing pens. That's what I was doing. So I grabbed a blue micron. And I'm using the blue for her silver uh, wrist, wristbands, her gauntlets here. Her bracelets, I guess, is the more appropriate word. So the, the way the, the bracelets overlap the skin, I'm using it to ink the... Uh, I, I ink the full line around it and adding some of the reflective shapes inside the the bracelet, then back to brown, because it's now moving further back, to ink the, back to inking her arm. And now I'm utilizing these shapes I, I, I put in to ink the muscles, the musculature, Some lines a little thicker on the outside, a little thinner on the inside. Being careful not to get too heavy with the definition of the muscles, but just enough to convey the strength and power, but not over-render. And when it comes to thick and thin lines, I like to start off a little thinner because I can always make lines thicker where, where, when and where needed. If things overlap something else, that, that's, there's probably going to be a, a thicker line where things overlap um, in the sense of a, a, of a subtle shadow being cast down onto that part that's being overlapped. So I'm using this brown for the golden lasso, her skin, and the gold parts of her uniform, like the the W here on her chest and her her belt a little bit later on when we get to the belt part. Keeping those curves in mind, the curves of the W for the curves of her body. Trying to keep both sides of the W as symmetrical as possible. So I'm really keeping them, really paying attention to the shapes I'm creating, but then also consider the other side of the W and how would that fit because we're going to see it from a slightly different angle than we are going to see the her right hand side of the W, our left hand side. So there's all of those sorts of things to think about when drawing or, or penciling or inking. Or what are the shapes, what is the consistency of the elements of a character's costume, their props, the figure themselves, things like that. Always trying to keep these things in mind, and then you do it for every character of every panel of every page. It's just sort of the, just the, the nature of, of creating, creating comics.
So a lot of decisions I make are based off of kind of where I am at the moment and really keeping in mind the things that I'm working on. Utilizing the, the information from of the, the knowledge I've gained on drawing characters in the past and how do I want to, what did I remember from then and how do I want to utilize that now. Forgot that her tiara is gold as well, so we're going to use this, continue to use this brown for her, her tiara keeping in mind the hair that falls over it, so that will be a black pen a little bit later on. Now coming down the side of her face, I'm gonna switch out pens, I believe, here from the 05 to the 01. It's a thinner pen, it allows me crisper, cleaner line and detail. I wanna keep the, the lines in her face really clean and don't wanna get them too muddy, so that's why I switched to a, 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 a smaller tipped pen, because I can take these thin lines and make them thicker if I need, but with this thin line, I can really keep things crisp. And that's what, that's what I want, with, especially with her face here. Especially in the, for the details inside the face, like the bridge of the nose, the nostrils here. I want very light, thin lines. Don't want them to get overpowered with thick, with a, the thick tip marker. Little parts of the earlobe here, just a little bit. Now I'm switching to a dark red. I think this micron is called wine. The color is called wine. It's a dark red. I'm using this for all the red parts of her costume, like her star-shaped earrings. Just inking the parts that will be seen. Some of the earrings will be covered by hair when we get to the hair stage. I'm going to utilize this same dark red colored micron for this part of her, her uniform. This new part that will be colored red, traditional red, will be inked with this dark red micron. Some light thin feathering there for her rib cage. Don't want to get too, too uh, heavy with that, with that sort of detail. Switching back to the brown, I think it's the 05 again. We're going to now ink the belt, because the belt overlaps over the red part of her uniform. Considering the sort of the, the uh, since it's kind of a golden belt, I want to have it, want it to have sort of a metallic look, especially when we get to colors. Adding a little bit of detail lines of the uh, the reflection as it would uh, it would convey the the world around here with the the shape of her mid section. Hopefully, I'm explaining that correctly. So right there, just a little bit, knowing that her mid section kind of pulls down this way. Gonna add some little lines in there that. Uh, that convey the, the, the shiny part of the metal. The kind of the dark lines are the uh, environment around her. Um, so it's I'm very I'm very deliberate in where I'm putting my detail lines. They're not just thrown in haphazardly, like when I inked her rib cage there or there with the uh, the, the the belt. I, I I'm I'm very deliberate. Uh, and now it's time for the hair. Coming in with a black micron now. I believe this is the 08. I'm coming in and following the flow of the hair that I established in the pencils. This has taken a lot of practice to, to get this kind of flow down. Adding darker chunks of hair for her black hair. 
especially the further we may move uh, away from the outer part of the hair, uh, where things overlap, is where they're going to be darker chunks of hair, for sure, because there's less light getting that to that part. So drawing hair can be a lot of fun, especially once you really get used to the shapes and the flow that comes with, like I said, a lot of practice. Drawing hair can be very difficult. I love looking at real life hair and studying the shapes and the curls and the curves of the hair and then how can I translate that in my art with my lines, with my shape. I used to buy hairstyle magazines back in the day, back before the internet was a, a, a public thing and we, had, we could run Google searches for hairstyles. I'd have to buy uh, hairstyle magazines, but it would be so cool to, to look at those hairstyles and see how do I translate this into line and, and shape. So utilize real life when you're drawing your hair. It'll, ultimately, over time, it will make drawing hair, or it should make drawing hair a bit easier. It, at least it has for me. But like I said, it's come with study and practice. So you can see the outer portion of the hair. I'm filling it, I'm, I'm making with a thicker line, then thinner lines on the inside, and then some black chunks of hair where, um, where necessary. Now, there's several different probably rules of thought with uh, drawing black hair. Is uh, Number one, considering the highlight. Where is the highlight in the hair? And w depending on the length of the hair, where are the multiple levels of highlight? And then the black parts would be the actual color of the hair, the black hair. Anything added to it would be a highlight. So when we come in in the Copic stage, when I come in with the blues and grays, that'll be the highlight to the hair. But the black is the color of her hair. She has black hair. That's her hair color. So I'm I'm when I'm what I'm inking here are shapes and lines to convey the the hair as well as keeping in mind the highlights for where uh, for the spaces where I'll be coming in with the Copic color. And that will be in the second video to follow this one next week. So with this Wonder Woman, I've kind of parted her hair a little bit on the right-hand side, on her right-hand side. So we have a chunk of hair that flo flows to the right, but a larger chunk of hair that flips over to her left. Because oftentimes, I, th I mean, I, I've seen it, her drawn several different ways, you know, with, with uh, the hair parted on one side, sometimes it's parted down the middle. It just really depends on your preference. Um, me, I like, I like it parted on one side and then flipped over to the other side. I just think it looks cool. And so that's the, the route I chose to go. So knowing that there's a part in the hair, then there will be darker portions of her black hair at the part because that's where the hair is pulling from and, and flowing to, so that there would be a darker shot, darker chunk of, of her black hair there, more so than the outer part where the light would be hitting. So I work with the outer curves first, and then, then I go to the, the inner curves of the hair to fall underneath. So again, it's the same concept of working foreground to background. I just kind of pick the chunk I feel is the most foreground as possible and start there and then work my way around it. And again, same with the pencils, I'll work on one section and then, for some reason, just flip over to another section before even finishing the one portion where I've, I was. And then maybe go back to that section or uh, yet another section, then come back to it. Again, I think it's just that uh, system refreshing, uh, keeping the eye fresh. So jumping from one portion to another, coming back to it, I see things maybe in a slightly different way. Might even just be a, a, uh, a minuscule difference, but it still all comes together. It still all works. 
At least it does for me. And I think it maybe in some ways it kind of keeps things interesting for me. I don't get too stagnant in one place for too long. And it doesn't really, and from my experience, I don't think it really matters if I jump from one place to the next as long as I finish the illustration, as long as I come back to where I needed to be and get everything penciled and inked as needed. So there's not any portion left undone by the time the illustration is done. I guess that helps me know when the illustration is done because I inked all the portions in whatever order it took to get there. But that's just me. And some of you might be similar to that. That's cool. And you might, some of you might be different th to that, and that's cool too. I love lo inking the curves of the hair. The, the curls, it's just, it's just, it's fun. The shapes are fun for me. I love seeing the shapes come together, especially in this stage, the final ink stage. These are the final lines. And just letting these, these shapes and lines twist and turn and curve, it's, it's eye candy for my eye, which I would hope would be eye candy for the viewer's eye. All these details can be, we, we used to call it eye candy back in the, in, in the Extreme Studios days. Um, all the details, that's, that's stuff for the eye to look at, you know, I, I, the eye to play with, no matter what it is we're drawing, whether it's a superhero, a robot, backgrounds, um, environmental elements like uh, objects in a room, all these little details, things that we can give your eye to look at, that's the candy for you to enjoy. Um, And so, especially with hair, especially uh, long hair, so much to play with, so much to um, to overlap, twist, turn, shapes to make. That's the fun of it for me. And all the while, I'm considering where am I going to be putting color in the next stage. What portions do I need to leave open? Which portions do I need to make black? And in some ways, a lot of this is second nature for me because I've done it for so long, so many times. So these rules of thumb that I've mentioned, like uh, considering the light source and the, the thick thickness or thinness of lines, these are things that when you do it enough, when you practice it enough, it becomes in many ways second nature. There are still things that I need to reference. You know, I'll still look up you know, depending on the hairstyle or uh, the type of element that I want to draw, I'll, I'll look up reference to make sure I'm, I'm getting the accuracy that I want or desire or need. But in some ways, there's so much I've cataloged in my head that I can tap into it and utilize it uh, when, when needed and necessary. So just another reason why we say practice as much as possible because you're building up your mental arsenal. You're building up what you know you can do to where it gets to a point where it's second nature. Much like in sports, you know, um, players of a, a different sport, I mean, throwing a ball is a basic sort of thing, but you, they continue to practice it so they can maintain the accuracy, like a quarterback in football, American football, I should say, because I know we have a lot of international viewers. Welcome, international viewers. But here in the U.S., for American rules football, the quarterback, you know, they, they, can, they, they need accuracy in how they throw the ball to get the right sort of spiral, the right sort of, right sort of lift and, and distance to uh, get it right to the receiver. And, and they, they practice it to a point where, it, in many ways, it becomes second nature. It's a, kind of the same with art. We practice these curves. We practice these lines. We practice these shapes so they become second nature. In many ways. Not to say we still don't study. It's not to say we still don't practice. We st not to say we still don't research and reference where necessary. Because that's, that's part of it too. But then sometimes part of it is just, you know it, so go for it. Chuck that ball into the end zone. And hope that you connect to your receiver. And sometimes we don't connect. Sometimes we, you know, it just doesn't work out the way we wanted. Maybe the, the, the illustration didn't 
pan out the way it was envisioned, hmm, it's frustrating, it's disappointing, but in some ways, it's okay. We can always draw another one. And when I learned to accept that and, and have that kind of grace on myself, and it's like, all right, it didn't work out, we'll try again. Maybe it'll work out better next time. It took a lot of pressure off and gave me the freedom to, you know, to fail, for lack of a better word. Trial and error. We learn from the error. So, um, because I don't really believe in practice makes perfect. I believe in practice builds confidence. Confidence in your skills. Confidence in what you know you can do. That's why we practice. Just like a, just like an athlete. We are an athlete of line and shape. So having that freedom to, to learn from our mistakes is, I believe, critical. And what helps me keep moving forward. Because I'm going to try again. Because I'm going to keep drawing. I'm not, I don't plan on giving up on drawing. Drawing is too much fun for me. It's been fun my, pretty much my whole life. And finding ways to evolve and to level up my skills and try new things and learn new things and find ways to draw things in a new way, different way, better way, more efficient way is, uh, is part of the journey. And with that is, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And it's all okay. Just don't stop drawing. Learn from each illustration. Whether it turned out the way you wanted or it didn't. You can still learn and apply that to the next drawing. So I'm leaving a lot of area here on the upper outer part of the hair. We're really going to come in with a lot of Copic color in the next video to really um, bring all of that home, uh, to really flesh all that out, for lack of a better term. Um, so I'm not filling her hair up with a lot of black, uh, just enough black to convey that she has black hair, and then the rest will be filling in with different shades of blue and gray to convey uh, the highlight color to her hair. So I'm really leaving some stuff open for what I can do with the Copic markers in part two of this video series. Well, let's see. I think I had to take a break for a moment, so I came back. That's why we had a little transition there. Probably had to go eat lunch or something like that. So with this video here, in case y'all didn't know, I... I uh, shot the video completely just drawing, and so I could focus completely on the line art, and then I've come in here and I'm doing the voiceover commentary separately so that uh, I could give the artwork my full, complete uh, attention. Another thing that's fun is when I'm jumping from one bit to the next, and leaving some parts unfinished while I work on another part and then go over to another part, not finishing a, the part I was just on, which I hadn't finished the part previous to that, when things really start to come together, when those parts I had left and I come back to, and uh, it's, it's like building a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you work on one section, then you start to work on another section, and then it gets to a point where those, those different sections start to, to meet and merge, Oh, that's a fun part for me when it comes to doing the illustrations like this. Especially with like detail of the hair like this with the shapes and lines. Uh, is is when when the parts of the puzzle all start to connect and come together and uh, start the, the picture starts to really form uh, in a very concrete way. That that's that's I think part of the thrill of it for me on a daily basis. And feel free to take your time with your art. If you don't have to rush, don't rush. Enjoy the, the process, the shapes. And the experience of what you're drawing.
Like for me, I'm enjoying each section of hair, each cut, each cut curl, filling in each black area and seeing, seeing the, 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 the illustration come together. That's part of the fun for me in, in, in creating, a big part of the fun for me, I, I, I think I'd say. Because we get to make something come to life on the page. We get to create the world of creating this, this, this world for, for this shot of Wonder Woman. I'm created this, this little moment. This is one snapshot in, in the life of, of Wonder Woman in this commission. Now, this is a convention commission, a pre-con commission, I should say. Someone who got on my pre-con commission list for the Long Beach Comic Expo. So, um, so I thought, you know what? It'd be fun to uh, record a video of drawing this pre-con commission. And so... Uh, so I'm getting to create this little world here, this, this snapshot of a, of, a, of a moment for this commission client. And, um, and that's the fun of, of, of world building, of world creating, of, of creating these moments for these characters. It's each little bit, each little, each little aspect of the character seeing it come to life, and that I get to be the one that brings this to life. I get to show, uh, we've seen, there's probably been thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of artists who have drawn Wonder Woman, whether it be in the comics, cartoons, uh, advertising, or uh, merchandising, I should say, or even fan art. You know, tons of people have drawn Wonder Woman, and I'm getting to show the world Wonder Woman my way, in my style. And that's the fun of comics, I think, is that there are so, there are so many different styles that we can enjoy, or not enjoy, appreciate. So many different, different takes and flavors. And that's what makes it fun for me. That's one thing I really appreciate about comics is that there's so many different... Every artist can bring their own flavor. So how do you find your flavor? It comes in time. It comes over time. A lot of people ask, how do you find your style? I say, don't worry about finding your style. Style. <laughs> your style will find you. Learn the basics. Learn how, you, learn how to draw these things. Learn shape and form and line. And then your style will, will birth out of the way you like to draw things, the way you like to put your lines down. It's okay to be influenced by your favorite artists. I think we all are said this before in other videos. That's totally cool. It's okay to learn from them because I know I learned from my favorite artists, a lot of favorite artists. But in many ways, I think learning from our favorite artists can kind of be like the training wheels, like riding a bicycle. And then it gets to a point where the training wheels come off and now you're pedaling on your own. We can still enjoy our favorite artists, still learn from our favorite artists, but we don't have to sit there with our favorite artists' comics at our desk and 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 try to figure out how to how 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 do I draw this the way they drew it? We kind of it's like now I'm going to draw things my way. So back to the brown marker or brown pen, I should say, for a few more details. Add a little bit of the bicep there, if you saw, just a little bit right there. Still I had to be very careful not to make her muscles too too overly defined. Took a risk there, but it paid off. Back to the black marker and adding some curves to the hair, adding some black chunks to the hair. Just need to add some black chunks and curves here to the, the back, the, the hair that's falling right here behind her arm, behind her back. Keeping in mind that her hair falls all the way behind her. So I need to, to convey that. And keeping in mind that the shapes are born out of a body of hair that is flowing completely behind her back. Keeping in mind the things that we cannot see to inform the curves that I'll make to the parts that we are seeing right here. 
So these are some of the things I'm thinking about when I'm inking or drawing, even just drawing, penciling or inking something is where, what is the entirety of the element that I'm drawing? What are we seeing and what are we not seeing? Because I want to create the right shape of these, of the, these parts of her hair here. They're based out, out off of a bigger chunk of hair that is behind her back. And this helps make this part of her hair look believable. And then little tiny wisps as we get further and further towards the end of the hair. And some of these chunks you might have seen that I put a little X inside. I, I created a shape and then I put a little X inside. That's called spotting a black. That means black will go in that little spot. So a lot of pencilers, when they're ink or penciling, they'll draw the section, then put a little X there. That tells the inker this is where you need to fill in black. Or when an inker is inking, like I'm doing here, that little X will remind me, come in with a brush later and fill in that black. So the X is a reminder. This part needs to be filled with black. Adding a few wisps from the black out towards the open area. Just making some new decisions as I go there. As I, I go here, I guess I should say. Maybe I'm noticing ah, that we have these layers of hair that would cast more of a shadow on this section or chunk of hair, so we need a little more, a little more dark, either chunks or lines. So I'm making new little decisions based off of what I've now created. A lot of people ask, how do you keep from overdoing an illustration? How do you know when you're done? And you know, from my experience, it comes from trial and error, learning from times where I've overdone it, and learning to develop the confidence in knowing this is enough. This is enough. Don't need to add any more. So it's kind of uh, based on a person-by-person -person basis. Looks like I'm probably changing out pens here. I'm going to change from one color to the next. So I'm probably making a decision at this moment. Uh, I was grabbing the finer tip pen to start to ink her eyebrows, so I'm coming in with a, probably, this is probably the 005 black micron. So we were talking about how to know when you've added the right amount of detail. Unfortunately for me, I wish I had a better answer than just, you kind of learn as you go. You kind of, if you find you've, you've, got, you've uh, made a mistake, learn from that mistake. That's um, unfortunately the the, the, the way, th that was my teacher, I guess I would say. So I push the camera in here so we can get a little tighter detail. Or I can get you a little closer to the detail of drawing the eyes so you can see, see how I ink the eyes just a little bit better. So I ink the upper part of the lid, then the eyelash coming off to the side here. Really enjoyed my fashion illustration classes at Art Institute. It was the, those classes were closest to the comic book art style um, that I got, got to have at, at art school at the time, back in the 1990s. Now for the other eye. This is the, the 005, so it's the finest point micron that they make to date, at least that I'm aware of. So it allows me the thinnest line possible that I can then build up the thickness of line that I want. Oops, I forgot to pull, slide this down. I really apologize for that. I got Sometimes I get so into the illustration I forget where I've put the art in relation to the camera. I do apologize. It looks like I'm spending far too long <laughs> off screen. So disappointing. So sorry, gang. I'll try to do better in the next video. <laughs> so there we go. We're back in. So it looks like I just finished the top and bottom eyelid. Or eyelash. Oh, some little eyelashes there on that side, so I didn't finish all the eyelashes. So I do apologize for that, gang. So grab my pencil here again, just tightening up the iris and pupils of her eyes to make sure they're right where they need to be. Don't want her to look cross-eyed. So this is the point three mechanical pencil, so it's a very time, fine tipped lead. Allows me to drop in those 
teeny tiny details. So now I'm coming in with a blue, a 005 blue micron, because she has blue eyes. So we need blue for her eyes. Now I'm switching out microns, and I'm coming back with a black. Black for the iris, right there in the center. A few touch-ups on the uh, eyelashes and eyebrows. Now back to, now to a double zero five brown micron. Drawing in the top of the eyelid, a little bit there on the cheeks. I think I'm switching microns again. And I'm coming in with, is this a pink? No, this is that, uh, that wine color, that dark red mic micron to ink the lips. Top lip, little teardrop top lip. A little heavier line on the, on the bottom lip there. Gives us, gives us a subtle sense of shadow. Back to the brown micron, finishing off a part of her tiara, adding some reflective uh, shadows to it there, reflecting the environment around her. That's what those black lines would signify. Smoothing out her chin there a little bit, beefing up a little bit lines a few of the lines underneath, her, her jawline and chin, because it's a little further from the light. Oops, looks like I slid off camera there for a second. Looks like I cut it, cut it early on that one. A few little detail, detail lines here. Little tick marks, little hash marks there. Just kind of gives a sense of the curvature of the muscle or the body part. Um, a little bit of a, like a, almost like a shadow rendering, but just very, very subtle. Don't want to get too heavy with it. Don't want it to convey um, maybe like a, like a hairiness. Now this part of the arm is going way back behind her there, so I'm utilizing lines to really convey a shadow there. And we'll really bring that home in the Copic color. And now to ink this fist, or actually before we ink this fist, I'm just utilizing my, again, my 0 3, or 0 0.3 mechanical pencil to just really flesh out these the, the shapes of these fingers to make sure that they I get them inked in the right way possible. and ensure that accuracy as best I can. Now I think I've got the 05 brown micron again, because we're using brown for her skin. And now I start to ink the, this fist. Starting with what is in the foreground, what's overlapping first, so I'm starting with a thumb. So it overlaps the fingers. And I'm starting with the index finger as it wraps around the what she's holding, making a fist there. And then I move to the middle finger, then I'll move to the ring finger and pinky and so on. So it all overlaps moving down the row of fingers. Finish off the palm of her hand here. Little wrist striations, the other side of the palm, a little darker, thicker line there at the bottom of the palm. Give that illusion of shadow. Very subtle, it's very subtle with the lines. I'm probably grabbing my blue micron if I know me, because we have to ink her other bracelet. Yep, and here we are with the blue micron. 
and overlapping or inking the overlapping part first. The entire bracelet overlaps her skin, so we're utilizing blue in its entirety from top to bottom. Or I should say the top side and the bottom side, where it connects to her wrist and to her the upper part of her forearm. And then the reflective um, detail here. The dark parts is reflecting the environment. The open part is more like reflecting the sky. I need to switch back to my brown micron to finish off the forearm here. Just building up some lines there on the chest that overlaps her arm. Grab my red there, I need to finish off that part of her torso. I'm going to utilize this red for her fingernails. One thumbnail, and oops! Wasn't on screen for that thumbnail, but there it is. Just a little more detail there. Now I've got a whole bunch of strands of rope to ink here. So I have to ink in each curve of the rope. So I start with the outermost one that I can discern. Follow my guidelines. and repeat the process moving further and further into the background. Creating different shapes of rope, the, the angles that the ropes cut as they, they flow about in her hand. It helps, I think, create a life to the rope. It almost makes the rope a character, much like how uh, Doctor Strange's cape was, ha had a life to it where it actually did have a life to it, it was a, a character, which I really appreciated about that aspect of the Doctor Strange movie, that his cape was essentially a, a character. Now, while Wonder Woman's rope does, is not really quite sentient, it is magical. But even if it weren't a magical rope, if this was, if I were, if I were drawing, I don't know, uh, Woody the Cowboy from Toy Story, and he had a lasso, I'd probably still utilize different shapes of, of rope, of, of the rope flailing about to create more eye candy for the viewer. Uh, so it doesn't look stagnant, doesn't look static. Now it's okay for it to look static and static if it's just, maybe just hanging there. If it's just hanging down to his side and there's not movement, but since I established Wonder Woman's in a sense of movement here. She's moving into battle stance. She's on the coast of Themyscira. Then it wouldn't be completely unreasonable for the, the rope to be blowing about in uh, different directions. So these are things to keep in mind in the story that you are telling. Because even though we're taking one, one little snapshot of a moment here, it's still a story. It's still that one moment in a story, and, and many things can be happening in that moment. So as I, as I draw each section of rope falling behind other sections of rope, I'm keeping in mind where those sections are falling. And I'm trying to not have any section of rope line up 
too much with the other section to where it creates a tangent. Some portions of it will line up because they were all lined up initially when she grabbed her lasso as they all converge towards her hand, but where each arc curves, I'm keeping that in mind. Here I am going completely freestyle, no guidelines, insanity. But see how I cut it right across that, that section of rope? Bring it down to that one, and then curving it just to the side of it. And then back up to where it meets up with her hand. These are design elements that I'm utilizing here as well, and where, where the lines are going to go. And then this is the, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the end of the rope. Because the other end is in the lasso in her other hand. Well, this is the, the tail end of the rope. Yeah, it is. So we're bringing it, curving it all the way. Whoop, there we go, around like that. Follow the suit with the other side. Bring it up and around. Boop. There we go. Magic lasso complete. Now let's see, what am I doing here? Getting camera frame. Me? Oh, inking her thigh, inking her leg. Hopefully here I'll have realized what I was doing and get it completely on screen, or apparently not. Again, my apologies, friends. All right, starting to fit. Uh, there we go. Now we're in, in camera frame. Hopefully I can stay in camera frame. Um, so inking the overlapping parts first. Man, I really, really got off camera frame pretty bad here. <laughs> There we go. Come on. Oh, I'm inking the blue part of her of her uh, costume here. That's what I was doing. So using blue for the blue parts of her pants there, and now the stars. Oh, not quite the stars. Oh, yeah, a little bit of this. Oh. Just using my pencil to rough in and make sure the stars are the right shape before I commit to inking them. There we go. Got it back in frame. So the stars will be white, but it will be blue surrounding them. So just using the blue micron to ink the stars as well as the pants themselves. It's all part of the pants. Now, it's probably going back to the brown mic micron, yes, to finish this thigh, her, what does that be, her left thigh. A little darker, or a little thicker line on the under portion of this thigh because it is furthest away from the light, essentially. Not, not heavily thick, necessarily. Well, I guess it is pretty thick, using a pretty thick line there to really help that calve pop. Back to the mechanical pencil to um, make sure I have the trim to, the white trim to her boots. Accurate, and maybe some of the wrinkles of her boots where it bunches up down by her ankles. As you can see there, just coming right down to the rock. using that dark red wine-colored micron. Thicker on the outside, a little thinner for the inner part of the 
wrinkles. A little extra darker spots there for shadow. Now I'm taking a gray pen. I think this is a this is a touch brand. Is that right? Yeah, a touch brand multi-liner. I think I was I'm not sure where I got this uh, set of gray multi-liners from Touch. Um, probably got them at a convention. And uh, so I'm using gray here for the white parts of her, uh, of the initial part of her, the stripe, but uh, red for the inner part. So the bulk of the boots will be red and the red will butt up against the white stripe, so we'll just leave the red on the inside and the gray for the top of the white boot stripe. Now I believe I'm going back to uh, the brown micron to add some more details here on the, the knee and back to inking the flesh tones here. Just thickening up some lines. One moving to the other thigh. So keeping in mind the shapes that I've roughed out here in the pencil stage, like I said before, is a guideline for me for how I will approach rendering the, the legs and the muscles. I don't use every line I've penciled in just a few of the key lines. I don't want to put a lot of lines here onto Wonder Woman uh, just because I want it to to um, not be too overly rendered. I don't want the muscles overly rendered. I want a sense of the mass, a sense of the, uh, the muscle structure uh, in kind of in as few lines as possible. Uh, it could be could be a bit of trial and error to figure out just which lines to ink. It's always better to err on the side of caution. Start with a few lines, then add a few more if necessary. You can always add more lines in. Can't take those lines out once I commit to them. But usually just kind of that inner thigh muscle and a little bit of rendering around the knee. Maybe a little rendering at the calf sometimes. But that's about it. That's about it for... for, uh, for rendering or which lines I choose to put in for um, a female character's musculature. So back to the gray and dark red multi-liners here for the boot. Little, little tick marks there again to give a little eye candy and um, convey the, the roundedness of the boot. And like I said, there's a few little, little calf muscle lines there. Just really tiny, really thin lines. Don't need to use a lot. Okay, gonna, looks like I'm pulling the camera back just a bit so we can uh, start work on the, the rocks here. And I really left a lot of this line art open for me to really play with, with the rocks. Now I've switched here to the Zebra uh, brush pen, which is uh, has a nice give to the to the nib in a brush sense and uh, allows me to create some really fun shapes. I can get more organic with the shapes.
and I can just come in here and put some some cross hatching and ideally I try to keep in mind the shape of what it is I am rendering and the direction that I want those lines to go. I try to be very deliberate. Uh, it's not just haphazard throwing throwing lines any which direction that can look can look m muddied. Um, even though this is a rock, it is essentially you know um, the earth. Uh, muddy is still not a a um, a desired outcome with the line work. So I, I try to be very, uh, very deliberate, that was the word I was looking for, deliberate in, in how I, I create my shapes and, and rendering, uh, where I create my darker shadow areas and where the direction I do my cross hatching. The angles that I, I seek to cut. And a lot of this has come from a lot of practice in drawing rocks and rubble over the many years of drawing comics. But it could be a really fun texture to play with and experiment with as well. So I'm essentially considering the these uh, graphic shapes, these uh, these uh, well, e each section is a chunk, you know, angular shapes, and I consider the light source and the texture of rock in my cross hatching and and the the nooks and crannies and crags of a rock. So look at real life rock, study rocks. Look at different types of rocks and look at the kind of textures that they make and, and how you can render that with line. Because different rocks will have different types of uh, textures and you'll want to render them in different ways. Like pumice rock from like a volcano would look much different than, I don't know, uh, you know some maybe like limestone or, or granite. Uh, some, some might have similar characteristics but some might be a bit, a bit different. And so, so you can experiment with the type of rock you might want to, might want to illustrate. So reference, reference rocks. Now with a brush pen, much like with a micron, the harder that I press down, the thicker of a line that I get, the lighter the, the, the pressure, the thinner the line. So it takes, takes some, takes a while to learn how much pressure to give and how much pressure to not give to achieve the the um, the variation of the line width that one might want or need I like to vary the the, the dark and light areas, keeping in mind the design aspect of where things would be dark and light to create a uh, positive and negative space, graphic shapes of positive and negative. And the positive would be the line that I'm putting down. The negative would be the open area. And much of that open area of the rock will be filled in with color later on. But I want to try to create as strong of a uh, of line work as possible, of black and white line art, as I can. And I also want to try to remember to keep the art in camera frame. I'm sorry, that happened again. Oh, and now it's even worse. I get so into the art sometimes, ah, there I realized I was, what I was doing wrong and got it back in frame there. Try to do better for future videos, gang. Just sometimes I get so into the art I forget that I'm, that I'm filming this. Now with rocks, it's fun to put in does these little, little dots and and uh, flecks of, of ink to really kind of give it a, a, 
rocky texture, um, organic texture. I like to put little rocks popping off of the main rocks. It creates a, a slight sense of movement. I try to be mindful where I where I place all these things so it's not too uniform. I try to want to avoid the spacing from being overly uniform, which can be a challenge. So it looks like I'm finished with the rocks, and now I want to. Okay, now I'm bringing in the uh, Mars plastic eraser here to gently erase all the pencil lines. Trying not to bear down too hard so I don't pull up the ink. Definitely want to make sure the ink is well dried. And I know this stuff up here towards the top of Wonder Woman is dry because I'd spent so, so much time inking other parts of the illustration. And while I'm inking this, the rock section is drying more. So don't get in a rush when it comes to erasing. Make sure that the ink is as dry as possible. I have made the mistake of smearing inks when they were not completely dry, because I got too excited about moving to the next stage, could not wait, and erased a little too soon. So, lesson learned there. So we're just gonna keep, keep erasing here, and then uh, after I get done with erasing, I will then fill in any of the black areas the larger black areas that I had spotted from earlier. So, as you see, once we get all the sketch lines out of the way, all those shapes that I was developing, or used to develop the, the structure of, of Wonder Woman, are no longer needed, but we still get that sense of musculature and mass and power and, and form even though I didn't need every little line that I'd drawn for each muscle grouping or body part. Pull the camera back, or attempting to pull the camera back again. Try to get a little bit of wider shot. Brushing away the eraser dust. Seeing if there are any other spots that need to be erased. That I might have missed or couldn't discern from the eraser dusts, eraser dust particles, I should say. So as you can see here now, these areas I'd left to be filled in black, bringing in the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen to spot those last bits of black area. So being very careful to bring the brush tip just to the border lines of each section. It takes a while to develop the, the touch needed to use the brush pen. So it takes continued practice like any other tool. Okay, so as I finish off uh, adding just a little more black here to the to uh, Wonder Woman's hair, I should say, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you see, be sure to leave me a thumbs up and a comment. I appreciate the interaction. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, feel free to click the subscribe button uh, so you don't miss out on future art videos. And if you're on the social media, so am I, and all my links are listed in the video description below. So here's a shot of the finished inks. Uh, with the different colored uh, Micron pens. Uh, hopefully you like this effect, and it'll be really fun to see how things come together in the Copic Color Art video coming out next week. So stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for hanging out. Keep on drawing. Keep having fun. Take care.